Welcome to the Christian Mysticism Podcast, where we explore the fascinating history of Christian mysticism from the early days of the church until today. I'm Alberto de la Cruz, and I'm joined by my co-host, Dr. Carlos Ayer, the T. Lawson Riggs Professor of History and Religious Studies at Yale University. How you doing, Carlos? I'm doing fine. How are you? I'm doing good. Glad to have you back on and looking forward to the 19th episode of the Christian wow. Mysticism Podcast. Okay. I can't believe we've done that so many up to this point. Seems like just a few to me. I know. It seems like we started just yesterday. Yeah. But it's been a great experience. I know I've learned a lot. I'm hoping our listeners have learned a lot. And we're all having a good time doing this. So last episode, we talked about St. Catherine of Siena, and this episode, we got another Catherine. That's right, St. Catherine of Genoa, which is in northern Italy on the Mediterranean coast. And Genoa was quite a, a maritime power when Catherine of Genoa lived there. It was, at the time, a very wealthy city, but also full of problems because of the fact that it was pretty much a mercantile hub. So you had ships coming in from everywhere, and always, always the risk of plague. Well, Genoa is always getting ships from everywhere, and, uh, you know, plagues back then could carry diseases from faraway places, and plague too. And this would figure very much in her life, a later part of her life, when she dedicated herself to doing hospital work. We have a general idea when the plague was. When was Catherine of Genoa born? Yes, yeah, she's born in 1447, and she died in 1510, which makes her a contemporary of Christopher Columbus, who was also from Genoa. And she was born to a very rich family, and her, her given name was Caterina Fieschi Adorno. But now she's, she's better known as St. Catherine of Genoa. So did she get started in the church at an early age? Uh, no, actually not. Uh, you know, she her family was not only rich, but very powerful. She was related to two popes, Innocent IV and Adrian V. So as happened routinely to young women of her class, at the age of 16, she was married off to a man who was a good match in terms of, you know, status and, and fortune. But uh, he was abysmally, awfully awful man, very dissolute, always having affairs with other women. And the two of them never had any children, actually, even though he was, he was always off with other women. And he, he was abusive to her. So it's not surprising then that she, you know, she was not very happy, especially given the fact that, like all of these arranged marriages, she had no say in it whatsoever. And she was stuck. She was stuck with this man. So after 10 years of, of marriage, at age 26, she begged God for an illness. We've been over this theme before, right, with Julian of Norwich especially. This is something that was somewhat common, especially women begged for when they were in some kind of miserable circumstance. So she begged God for an illness. And then while going to confession one day, not because she was ill, but simply by going to confession. She had a mystical experience during confession when a ray of divine light, according to her, a ray of divine light made her very painfully aware of her own sins. And she regarded this as her conversion experience. And that, so it's at age 26 that she starts to embark on a life of continual prayer, penance, extreme fasting, like Catherine of Siena, except at a later age. And she began to have mystical raptures. And uh, she attended church daily and took communion daily as all of this was happening and as her, her life at home continued to be absolutely miserable. And as she was having these mystical experiences and praying and fasting, she began to work at a hospital where she cared for the sick and the dying. And she did so and survived during two plagues, one in 1497 and the second one in 1501. Did she ever become a nun? No, she did not. No, 
she is one of these lay people who pretty much did the kind of work that some nuns would do, you know, in the hospital. But the thing is that eventually her husband also had a conversion experience. So they remained married. And after having his conversion experience, he joined her at the hospital and helped also as she did. He would die in 1497 during one of those plagues. But she continued the work by herself, you know, without her husband at the hospital. And she eventually became its manager and its treasurer. So basically, she was in charge. It was the Pamatone Hospital in Genoa. And after her husband died, you know, she kept taking care of the sick and dying. And I always like to keep in mind that hospitals back then, you know, there were no good medications for severe pain. So it's not a, as it is in today's hospitals where, you know, patients who are suffering a lot can be doped up. No, she was, she had to confront absolute genuine suffering day after day. I mean, today a hospital is not necessarily a, a pleasant place. I could only imagine what it would have been like in that era where everybody that was there, I imagine would be suffering greatly because, yes. you know, now you get a hangnail, you can end up a day in the hospital. But back then, I would imagine only the severely... Yes, severe cases, and in many cases, hospitals were what we now call a hospice, right? It's a place where very sick people went to die. Although, you know, of course, some recovered, but it's hard to imagine what she faced day to day. But then when she was 53, sometime around the year 1500, she developed a fever. Not unusual for somebody who works in a hospital. She developed a fever and that fever became permanent. It was a constant fever that never went away for the rest of her life. And I haven't seen any kind of workup, medical workup on what her fever might have been. But we do know this, we have record of this, that the fever made her skin get darker, change shade, it became darker, and it had a definite yellowish hue to it. Sounds a lot like jaundice to me. But back then, of course, diagnostic tools were few and far between. She lived like this till her death, and she and others began to consider this constant fever a purging fire from within. And she herself considered it a purging fire of divine love. Basically, purgatory on earth that burned her from within. Very odd. I don't know of anyone else like her, mystic or not mystic, who basically considered herself to be undergoing purgatory while still on earth. As I said before, she died in 1510, and everyone recognized her as a living saint. So it might seem like a long time. She wasn't beatified until 1675, and she wasn't canonized or declared a saint till 1737. But when she died was just on the eve, just a few years before the beginning of the Protestant Reformation. And the Protestant Reformation actually caused... All the turmoil caused the Catholic Church to um, actually drop the number of canonizations tremendously. And for a long time, for decades, there were no canonizations, simply because the canonization process was being completely overhauled. So she wasn't beatified for quite some time or canonized for even longer period of time, 1737. But finally, she was recognized for what she was, a saint. So what made her mysticism different? Well, her ecstasies, many of them revolved around purgatory and the process of purgation. And in this respect, she is unique. And also in this respect, she had things to say that didn't match up neatly with popular attitudes towards purgatory and purgation. And perhaps the main thing revealed to her, which she then wrote about, was the fact that purgatory is a place of suffering and of pain, but there's a certain gladness in all of this. And she also said repeatedly that one of the worst things that could happen to anyone in purgatory would be to be 
taken out of it prematurely before the cleansing process had been finished. So here's a quote from her treatise on purgatory. And I'm quoting, the soul in which there is even the least note of imperfection would rather cast itself into a thousand hells than find itself thus stained in the presence of the divine majesty. Therefore, the soul, understanding that purgatory has been ordained to take away those stains, casts itself therein and seems to itself to have found great mercy in that it can rid itself there of the impediment which is the stain of sin. Which is an amazing statement. You know, the soul is very glad to be there, and the soul would rather cast itself into a thousand hells than to skip out of purgatory prematurely. You mentioned that her writings and her her view of purgatory matched up with the idea of purgatory at, at that time. Is there a significant difference the way purgatory was viewed in that era to today? Oh, definitely. Definitely. I mean, today in the Catholic Church, purgatory is, is hardly ever mentioned in church at Mass, although Catholics still have Masses said for, for their deceased. It just doesn't have the same weight that it had on people back then. It's just amazing how much attention was paid to the souls in purgatory in her day and for centuries afterwards. The number of masses said for the dead back in her day and for centuries thereafter was immense, absolutely immense. I mean, I spent a good number of years studying and analyzing last wills and testaments from 16th century Madrid in Spain. And it's very, you know, any lawyer reading one of those wills, would recognize its second part, not very different from any modern will. However, every will in Catholic countries, Catholic societies, the first part of the will had to do with your soul, and you had to stipulate how many masses were to be said for your soul, where they were going to be said, what kind of mass, high mass, you know, with singing, or, or just a, a spoken mass, low mass. And the wills I've read, some individuals actually made their souls the sole heir of their entire fortune. <laughs> and no pun intended there. Soul, soul S-O-U-L, and soul, S-O-L-E, the only. And I actually had one will which was very f revealing and very, in, in a way, funny, but also tragic. It was a priest's will. And he made his his soul, his his anima, or alma in Spanish, the heir of his entire estate. And he wrote a little paragraph. He had the notary add a little paragraph because you know, wills were dictated to notaries. Anyway, <laughs> he basically said, I know my family is going to challenge this, <laughs> but I've spent, I've dedicated my whole life to serving others. I had to pay for my own education. No one ever helped me with that, and no one has ever offered me any assistance of any kind from my family, you know, in my priestly duties. So therefore, my soul has earned this. <laughs> and he basically dared them to challenge the will. This all belongs to me. I'm not being selfish. And I read that, you know, in some archive in Madrid, and, and I laughed right there and then as I was reading it. I'm still laughing about it. Because it just sounds so real, so very understandable. This man had obviously, you know, struggled to pay for his education. And his family might have had also uh, some money that never came his way. But, you know, imagine leaving your entire estate to yourself just to have masses said for your soul. That reminds me of an old joke about a man who... In his last will, he said he wanted to be buried with all his money. So the day he was buried, somebody went up to the wife and said, so he wanted to be buried with all his money. I didn't see any money in the casket. He goes, oh, he had it. I wrote a check out and put it in his pocket. <laughs> well. So he was sort of buried with his money, yes. except yeah. he'll never be able to cash the check. Yeah, well, this is it. And the check would decompose, too, so. 
being buried with gold coins is one thing. But anyway, well, I guess the point I, I want to stress here is that purgatory was very much on everyone's mind. And it was believed. I mean, the church taught this, right? And the people weren't making this up. They were just following church teaching that every mass could be dedicated to the soul of someone in purgatory to help reduce their suffering and their time in purgatory. And this is why people had hundreds or thousands of masses said for themselves and for their relatives too. Because these mass requests in the wills I read were not just for the individual who was writing the will or dictating the will to a notary. They were also for family members. It was commonly believed, and this goes way, way back to the late antique, early modern period. The mass, which is a re, it's not a reenactment in the, in the sense that you're acting it out, but every mass makes the sacrifice of Christ on the cross present there and then. In other words, every mass transcends time and space. There it is. This is, this is Christ being sacrificed. Not again, because he was only sacrificed once, but it's a, it makes it present. So therefore, over the first few centuries of Christian history, uh, the custom arose of dedicating masses to specific people who had passed away. And the amount of money spent on masses in Madrid, this is what I discovered, was astronomical. The amount of, not cash so much, but uh, because most of these masses were paid for through gifts of real estate to the church or rents on land or real estate. You know, like the will might read, and, and you know, the rent from this property over here, and it names the property, will go to pay for these masses. So Catherine of Genoa in Italy, the same thing was happening. This is this was very, very common in late medieval Catholicism, which Protestants do away with, of course. But St. Catherine would have been part of this Catholic culture that put a great emphasis on helping the souls in purgatory. It's interesting because having lived here in Miami all my life and uh, attended Catholic masses in predominantly Hispanic churches, the praying for the souls of the departed has always been present. It's it's always mentioned at the beginning of the mass, you know, in the right. intentions. And so it, it sort of sounds foreign to me, uh, even though I have attended masses in other places outside of, of Miami, but it's something that I hear every Sunday. But with that said, Hispanics do tend to be of the more traditional sort mm -hmm. when it comes to the practicing of Catholicism. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You know, nowadays, though, someone might have a yearly mass said, and you get to hear about it on Sunday or during a, a weekday mass, too. But I read wills, many of them, where people were requesting daily masses for themselves or for someone else. Or actually, uh, many wills, also people were requesting masses for themselves. Por siempre jamás. <laughs> Forever, until the final judgment. And there was this very weird math involved in calculating time and purgatory. And I have yet to see any good scholarship on this, how these calculations came to be that time in purgatory was considered to be a different kind of time than time on earth, where you could spend thousands of purgatory years in purgatory, thousands, but that was not the same as earth time. And someone at some point came up with this calculation that one day's suffering on earth equaled a thousand years of suffering in purgatory. So, all of this is in the background of Catherine's mystical experiences of purgatory. In many ways, she's part of this, very much so, but she's also calling into question, perhaps challenging the popular obsession with purgatory as a place where people just want to escape as quickly as possible. 
So let's talk a little bit about her visions and raptures that she had with purgatory. Can you describe some of them? Sure. And I, the best way to do that is to um, actually quote her because she explains it all very, very clearly. And here's one quote. The souls in purgatory see all things, not in themselves nor by themselves, but as things are in God, on whom they are more intent than on their own suffering. And that could be unpacked a million ways, right? They don't see things in themselves or by themselves, but as they are in God. And then she adds that the souls in purgatory are more focused on this than on the suffering. And then she continues saying, for the least vision they have of God overbalances all suffering and all joys that can be conceived. Yet their joy in God, that's the joy of the souls, their joy in God does by no means take away their pain or lessen it. This process of purification to which I see the souls in purgatory subjected, I feel within myself. So after describing all of this, which is in fact kind of a mystical state in which you see things as God sees them, in purgatory, she says, she felt those. So we go back to this, you know, very mysterious illness that she had, which she came to regard as an inner purgatory of sorts in her. And others too came to recognize it that way. And what she focuses on in many of these uh, descriptions that she has of purgatory and purgation, it all has to do with the idea that moral imperfection is not just an obstacle to one's ultimate fulfillment. And here we get into, you know, formal theology, formal theology. What is the ultimate fulfillment of every human being? The ultimate fulfillment is to have an unending enjoyment of the presence of God. And you can read that everywhere and anywhere in Catholic literature. This is, you know, the so-called Baltimore Catechism, which was used here in the United States for decades, from the 19th century through the 20th century until Second Vatican Council. First question was, why did God make me? The answer was, so I could know him and love him. Very nice short way of putting it. But what we get from uh, Catherine's texts is that the perfection needed to get to that state is indeed perfection, right? Being without stain of sin. But more than that, it means that your will, which is how we do our choosing and how we choose to do things that are sinful or wrong, the will is cured. It's So simultaneously, there's a purification going on, like, you know, removing stains from a piece of clothing, putting shout on it <laughs> before you wash it. Oh, good. The stain is gone. Yeah, this image of, of the soul being stained is both a metaphor and a very real thing, too. But imperfections, too. It's not just a stain. It's also sin is also seen as an imperfection. Pretty much like anyone who has been engaged in creating any sort of art. Like, for instance, a sculpture and polishing it so that all the imperfections are gone. Or painting, where you correct all the imperfections if you want it to be just right. Or even the, the art of writing. Crafting a sentence that is just perfect sometimes takes a lot of effort. But here's another quote from her that sheds light on this aspect of perfection. She says, So many hidden imperfections are in the soul that if it was able to see them, it would live in despair. But now she's talking about purgatory. In the state of which we have spoken, in purgatory, they are all burnt away. And only when they have gone does God show them to the soul, so that it may see that divine working which kindles the fire of love in which its imperfections have been burnt away. So, to paraphrase, says, we're not aware of all our imperfections. We can't be. And if we were aware of all our imperfections, 
it would be too much for us to take. We would live in despair constantly. So in purgatory, these are cleansed away. And it's only after they are cleansed away, she says, that the souls in purgatory become aware of them, that in fact they had all these imperfections. So purgatory cleanses the sins or awful things that we've done that we're not aware of having done or have conveniently buried so that we don't have to look at them. Would you say her raptures and her ecstasies, however we refer to them, were they just about purgatory? Oh, no, but the focus, the focus is, and you know, her main text, it's called Purgatory and Purgation. So this is like her specialty. She is very much focused on this issue of the way in which the human soul, in order to have relation with God, needs to have a state of purity, which this is something that all other mystics say. She happens to put a very special emphasis on this, right? In a way that no, no other mystic I have read talks in the same way about this purging. If we go back to one of our earlier podcasts, right? We went over the three basic steps of the Christian mystical path. First is purgation. And then the second step, illumination. You begin to get closer to God and to have experience, closer experiences of God. And the third, union, that's the highest state in all mystics that I've read, Christian mystics that I've read, speak of union as you know being just a very temporary state in which one cannot stay because it's basically the ultimate state of bliss in heaven. What Catherine of Genoa is, is saying is that this purgation does bring you closer to God, but purgation to be undergone after death is, in fact, the second step of the mystical quest. Now, most mystics don't break down the mystical path into these three steps as you know cleanly and neatly as, as I have just done. In many cases, the mystics emphasize that purgation continues throughout one's life, and then it gets mixed with illumination and perhaps, you know, moments of union, but throughout your whole life, you continue to have the need to be purged of things that you do wrong, because we have to remember too, that, you know, in this scheme of things, a sin is not just an act. It also can be thoughts, right? And it could be wishes and desires that one has that are wrong. Those are imperfections. Those count as sins. Back in the 1950s, before Vatican II, Catholics were always urged when going to confession to also bring up their bad thoughts, to identify their bad thoughts that they had had. I was angry at so-and-so, and I wished that, uh, you know, they'd get in an accident or something like that, you know. Or just, I was angry at so-and-so, and I hated them. Well, that's a bad thought. That also is an imperfection. So what we have to sort of put up front here with Catherine of Genoa is that her experiences are focused with a great intensity on this issue of perfection and therefore also of imperfection and of the imperfections that have to be done away with before one can reach the real gift, the real purpose of human existence, which is to be near God. And she emphasizes the fact that the process in purgatory, painful as it is, is also full of joy because you, you know, you know that you are being, let's say if you're like a sculpture, you're being polished to perfection. And if we analyze this uh, a little deeper, you know, what she is saying is that our very self, very purpose of our being has everything to do with being morally perfect, having the right will, a will that will not desire bad things. You know, here's another quote from her that deepens this insight I just spoke about. She says, so intimate with God are the souls in purgatory, and so changed to his will, right, to his will, 
that in all things they are content with his most holy ordinance, that is, with whatever God chooses. And if a soul were brought to see God, when it still had a trifle of which to purge itself, a great injury would be done to it. For since pure love and supreme justice could not brook that stained soul, bear it with its presence, would not befit God. It, the soul, would suffer a torment worse than ten purgatories. And then she adds, To see God when full satisfaction has not yet been made, even if the time of purgation lacked but the twinkling of an eye, right? it would be unbearable to that soul to be brought to God's presence. It would sooner go to a thousand hells to rid itself of the little rust still clinging to it than stand in the divine presence when it was not yet wholly cleansed or entirely cleansed. And that's pretty extreme if you put it side by side with popular piety of her day, where th- there was this conception of purgatory as some place you would want to escape from as quickly as possible. Purgatory definitely has its negative connotations. And I remember as a child hearing, you know, be good so you don't go to purgatory, you can go straight to heaven. <laughs> Me too. (laughs) But here's the thing. Purgatory is a place of hope, and it needs to be viewed uh, from this perspective as something that enlarges the number of humans who can be saved. It is something that develops gradually in the early church. And then in the early Middle Ages, then it, it you know becomes more important. And as time progresses, it keeps getting more and more attention and becoming more and more important. Because to land in purgatory is to be saved. Because purgatory is temporary. Everyone gets out of purgatory. It, it's not the equivalent of, a let's say, a, a prison life sentence where you, you're stuck in there until the day you die. No, it's a place that you enter knowing you are going to leave. And that when you leave, you're going to be a better person. So it's a very hopeful conception of the afterlife. You know, it doesn't matter how much you might have failed in this life to be a good person. The belief was if you die, you know, repentant for your sins, and you have no really awful sins that you're not in the least bit willing to repent for, you would go to purgatory. That's where most people would go. So heaven was reserved for the really good. Hell was reserved for the really bad. The majority of humankind was saved. They would just have to gradually become better in the afterlife. And there would be some amount of suffering. And, you know, to some extent, one has to question how much of the imagery of purgatory is a place with flames, right? A place with flames, burning, heat is a metaphor. I find C.S. Lewis's version of purgatory quite interesting in his book, The Great Divorce, where you're in a world and everything is just static. And it's almost up to the individual to basically let go of everything, all their imperfections, and be able to go towards God. I'm not saying it's theologically correct. Uh, I just found that an interesting way of looking at it. And if you haven't read the book, I'd highly recommend it. It's uh, C.S. Lewis mm. is obviously a brilliant writer, but it's, it's a really, yeah. it's, a, it's a, it's a short book. It's a quick read and it's very interesting the way he, yeah. he puts it. Well, you know, uh, C.S. Lewis was Anglican Protestant, you know, Anglicans are fairly close to Catholics and on many points of doctrine as well as ritual and symbols. But, you know, Protestants beginning in the 16th century rejected the very idea of purgatory completely. There was no such place. There was no such state. You only had two destinations at death, either heaven or hell. And Protestants did away with this whole idea of purgation being necessary after death. So in a way, what C.S. Lewis is doing is, is kind of reworking the whole purgatory idea in a somewhat Protestant or evangelical way. 
But we can find something very similar, actually, in Dante, the great poet, Dante Alighieri, his Divine Comedy, divided into three separate books. And it's all one long poem. Inferno, hell, purgatorio, purgatory, or paradiso, paradise. But the second one of those three books in the purgatorio, the image he conveys in his poem is that purgatory is very much like a mountain, a cone-shaped mountain with different levels as one progresses from the bottom of the mountain to the very top. And at the very top is the Garden of Eden. And through the Garden of Eden, you enter paradise. There are no flames. The soul goes through different forms of recreation, remaking of itself as it makes progress, ridding itself of the impurities, of the stains. And it's a very hopeful place where there is a kind of joy even in the lowest level because you know that you're going to emerge into paradise. You know you're on your way to paradise. So that's also a very Catholic view, too. The idea of flames, uh, purgatory, has received quite a bit of attention. But there's disagreement as to you know how much of a metaphor that is, what, how much of a reality it is. And it doesn't matter, ultimately. The thing is, it's purifying suffering that's being talked about. In a way, uh, divine justice, if you've done some things that are wrong, you're paying for that. But the thing is that you're not paying for it as mere punishment. No, you're paying for it by being cleansed of it. It's no longer part of who you are. And that is Catherine of Genoa's message, is that no matter what you have done, even the things that you're not aware were wrong, they'll be taken away from you. And that won't be who you are. The, the shame that one feels about things that one has done wrong, that can be a very heavy burden. And actually, at every psychiatrist's office, <laughs> it's kind of a, I'm laughing, you know, but it's kind of a secular version of purgatory. Well, you don't only talk about your fears, right? You're forced to talk about the things that you don't like about yourself or the things you've done wrong, so on and so forth. And if it's the right kind of psychiatrist, the things that you're not aware of the fact that you've done wrong, you find them out for yourself. Kind of like C.S. Lewis would say, right? It's up to you. In a way, it makes perfect sense. I should say pun intended, because God is yeah. perfect. <laughs> <laughs> and God cannot have anything that's imperfect before him. And this is not something that started with Christianity or, or with the Catholic Church. Uh, you go back in, to Isaiah in chapter 6 where he sees God sitting on a throne and a seraphim calls out to him and he says, you know, he replies, and I'm quoting here from Isaiah chapter six, woe to me for I am ruined because I am a man of unclean lips and I live among people of unclean lips for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of armies. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a burning coal in his hand, which he had taken from the altar with tongs. He touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips, and your guilt is taken away, and atonement hmm. is made for your sin. Yeah. So many of the Psalms, too, in the Old Testament refer to uprightness, right? Being morally correct as the most important aspect of any human's relationship with God. So the Psalms repeat this over and over again in, in many, many different ways. And I think that, you know, this speaks to a, you know, human desire for perfection, but it's a very, you know, in the Christian tradition, and especially with Christian mystics like Catherine of Genoa, it's not about perfection of the sort that an Olympic athlete works very hard to obtain so they can be better than everyone else. It's the kind of perfection that you go, you work very hard at it, not so that you can be better than everyone else, but so you can be the best possible you. Not better than everyone else, but you reach your real, true potential, which is different for everyone because everyone makes different mistakes. So in this sense, you know, I, I didn't read Catherine of Genoa until I was in my mid-30s. So I had all my education behind me already. And she was one of the biggest surprises I have encountered post-doctorate. <laughs> 
Let's call her a postdoctorate experience. A surprise, a real surprise. I was just stunned the first time I picked up her text. Absolutely did not know what I was going to say in class or how to teach this because it just seems so totally contrary to popular piety, but at the very same time, so totally faithful to what are the deepest teachings about human self and human potential and the relationship between the divine and the human. I still find it somewhat difficult to talk about it, and maybe our listeners are picking up on that, but she is uh, quite remarkable. St. Catherine of Genoa's teachings are so focused on purgatory and the cleansing of sins. And we know it's a difficult topic because a lot of our listeners, a lot of Christians, are not Catholic or or Orthodox Christians uh, who believe that there is that intermediate step between death and being in the presence of God in heaven. But it is something that, at a minimum, is worthy of of a conversation and, and an understanding. And of course, you know, we're just going off of what we think we know, but we won't really know until our time comes exactly how it all works. Yes, that's true. That's absolutely true. So considering purgatory is a, a controversial subject and you have a wide array of different students, how, how has been the reaction to this, to your teaching of St. Catherine of Genoa from your students? Yeah. Well, to be honest with you, I think purgatory is now kind of a a strange and hardly ever encountered concept on the part of my students when we read this text. If they've taken a course on Dante, for instance, they know about purgatory. (laughs) But if they haven't, chances are that they have not encountered it. Even, Even those who have gone to Catholic schools from kindergarten through 12th grade, to them, this is not part of their Catholicism. So it's a totally new concept to them. Yeah, if not totally new, it's just, you know, kind of strange and bizarre. or something they have not given much thought to. So it has a kind of unreality to it. That's in my experience. I, I have yet to encounter a student who responds to it by saying, oh, this makes perfect sense to me. <laughs> I have yet to hear any such comment. But for those of us... Uh, who were pre-Vatican II Catholics, grew up with purgatory being a very real thing and a very constant subject, not just in our education, but in church itself, in the ritual, in the Mass. I think it's very different. For me, it's always been a difficult subject or or a difficult concept to wrap my head around. And I, I guess it goes back to what you were saying, how post-Vatican II, there really isn't a lot of emphasis placed in the teaching of the Catholic Church or that you're exposed to in the Catholic Church regarding purgatory. And it's just a difficulty in understanding and that I feel I have a better understanding of it, but I still struggle with it. And and I'm sure I'm not the only one. Oh, no, no. I think almost everybody does, you know, and almost everybody struggles with the same issue when they have personal suffering in this world, which is, you know, suffering is suffering. Suffering is bad. It's terrible. Suffering is terrible. Nobody wants to suffer. Nobody wants to be in constant pain or nobody wants to encounter painful experiences. But there is this sort of secular notion of suffering being good for you. I mean, there's a quote from Nietzsche, the philosopher, that which does not kill me makes me stronger, which it is a secular kind of purgatory that he's talking about. That which does not kill me makes me stronger. I guess St. Catherine of Siena would say that, you know, the suffering I endure makes me purer or cleaner or a better me. You also see it throughout the epistles in the New Testament where a lot is made of the suffering on earth as making you stronger, purifying you, making right. you a better person that, yes. you know, the Apostle Paul says, you know, welcome to suffering, give thanks in suffering because it's for your own good. Yes. It's like refining silver or refining gold. That's another image you find in the Old Testament too. Yeah. I mean, the the burning and the refining, it's 
it's a very prominent theme in the New Testament. As I mentioned earlier, Paul, St. Paul mentions in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and I'll quote here verses 11 through 15, For no other foundation can anyone lay that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, each man's work will become manifest, for the day will disclose it, because it will be revealed with fire, and the fire will mm. test what sort of huh. work each one has done. Oh, wow. Yeah. If the work which any man has built on a foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If any man's work is burned up, he will suffer mm. loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. Oh, wow. You know, during the early years of the Protestant Reformation, there was, of course, a lot of debating about whether or not there was any mention of purgatory in the Bible. And of course, Protestants came to the conclusion that there was nothing in the Bible that refers to purgatory. But here's a passage that Catholics, of course, interpret it as having a purgatorial meaning, as well as the saying of Jesus that there are some sins that can't be forgiven even in the next life, which is a roundabout way of saying that there are sins that can be forgiven in the next life. And those are two Catholic biblical references to purgatory. But suffering's always a mystery. And whenever you're talking about the, the divine God, mysteries always are the rule, not the exception. That's right. As well as feelings of insufficiency on the part of the human, or uncleanliness, or not being worthy. I am not worthy. I am not worthy. Or I am not clean enough. At least for me, this conversation has answered some questions and, of course, raised some new ones because this is a topic that continues to be a difficult one for me to grapple with and, and I'm sure for, for a lot of our listeners. But it's definitely been fascinating and, and interesting to see how St. Catherine of Genoa really focused on this and the way she viewed it, which I think the most important takeaway here is that she saw it as a positive thing, as something that prepared us to be in the presence of God, not necessarily a, not a punishment, but as a cleansing, as a purging, which right. comes from the origin of the word. Now, whether there's an actual purgatory, there's an actual place, or it's just something that happens, we will all find out at one point. But until then, I think we got some very good insight on that today in our talk. And I'm sure we're going to get a lot of questions on this uh, after the episode goes yeah, live. Prob probably, probably because this is, uh, well, it's uh, for one thing, it's a subject we haven't touched on yet before. So, Yeah, not in any meaningful way. But one that I think really needed to be spoken about because a lot of these mystics that we're discussing are from that age and that era where the Catholic Church was prominent and its teachings were prominent. So... Uh, I think it's important that we at least understand what was being taught, what was being said, so we can get a better grasp of where these mystics were coming from and, and how they viewed those visions and ecstasies and raptures that they had. Yeah. And next time, why don't we deal with something that could be said to be the exact opposite of what we spoke about today? Mystics who thought they were perfect. <laughs> That sounds like a good segue into that. So you have one for us for the next episode? Yeah, one one in several. There's one mystic, Marguerite de Porret, who was burnt as a heretic in 1310 for espousing certain teachings concerning perfectibility of human beings. But the larger stage that she was on, one of many who were accused of having similar teachings or espousing similar teachings, who were known as the free spirit heretics, or the heresy of the free spirit. So here we move into territory we haven't covered yet, which is Christian mystics who were declared to be totally wrong by the church of their time. And I always think of the chapter title of a book that deals with the free spirit heresy, which calls them moral elite superman that sounds very interesting the heretical mystics yes 
just one of one of many one of many such groups who have popped up continually here and there because you know there are scholars who say that mysticism is inherently dangerous to any institution to any church because it it bypasses it they claim you know a mystic always bypasses at some point bypasses the church completely and goes directly to god kind of skips the whole process <laughs> yes yeah but it's a dimension of mysticism that i think we need to deal with so we'll do it next time looking forward to it and thank you for another great episode and until the next time thank you for listening to the christian mysticism podcast if you have any questions for dr air you'll find our email address in the show notes just send it over and we'll try to answer it in a future episode And don't forget to click the subscribe button so you don't miss the next episode of the Christian Mysticism Podcast.